going to talk this morning here for a bit uh, about the mediastinum and the hyla. And first I want to touch on the uh, normal anatomy and then talk about various types of pathology that we might see. In terms of the normal anatomy, there have been a number of different ways of classifying the mediastinum. We're all used to probably the traditional method, but there are also another uh, method, the Felsen method and the Heitzman method, which have been used on and off, especially with regard to a surgical approach to the mediastinum. I want to talk a little bit about normal interfaces because it's the visibility of normal inter interfaces like the anterior junction line, posterior junction line that give us a clue as to whether there's any kind of pathology. And then we'll talk about some uh, anatomic variants. I want to talk a little bit in terms of pathology about uh, inflammatory lesions, which will include acute and chronic uh, mediastinitis, pneumomediastinum we'll take a look at, and then we'll talk about some neoplastic uh, pathology, including mediastinal masses. The traditional method, so-called traditional method, is what we're used to in terms of an anterior, a middle, and a posterior mediastinal compartment. It's very good for characterizing disease processes. And for just a brief review, of course, we'd have the anterior mediastinum here, middle mediastinum, posterior mediastinum, and we can see sort of normal interfaces. You can probably see a junction line anteriorly here. Everything looks nice and clean here. The Heitzman method is good for understanding uh, anatomy from a surgical approach because it discusses things in terms of the thoracic inlet level, an anterior compartment, a supra and infra aortic area, and then on the right side, a supra and infra azagous region, and of course, the hyla. At the thoracic inlet level, we've got the right and left uh, brachiocephalic veins, common carotid arteries, the subclavian arteries, the trachea, the esophagus, and those are the normal structures we should be seeing. Those are what we see right here, the left and right brachiocephalic veins, and then the normal arteries that you are all familiar with. This case here, we've got a little bit of a variant of uh, normal. So you can see, instead of having to take off of the normal uh, left carotid, left uh, subclavian and right uh, brachiocephalic arteries. We've got a large vessel that comes around here, and this is an aberrant right subclavian artery. It's something that you can re should recognize because we see it not that infrequently. A lot of times, uh, just glancing at a CT, you might not recognize it. Um, you look at the structures, everything looks arterial, but it can cause, sometimes symptomatically, indentation on the posterior aspect of the esophagus. Other things we might see in the anterior mediastinal compartment would be the thymus. We should see a superior recess, the anterior junction line, an inferior recess, and a retrosternal stripe, maybe a cardiac incisura. And right here, we can see a very nice anterior junction line. The importance of seeing an anterior junction line on chest radiograph is that if you can see that, you're almost certain that there's not going to be any kind of anterior mediastinal mass because that's the kind of thing that would be pushing the lungs apart from coming together. Of course, the junction lines are formed by the two lungs coming together and touching each other with their thin pleural surfaces. The other things that we should be able to see at this area, we should be able to see a very thin right paratracheal stripe. This is what's called the supraazagous area. Um, this is the infraazagous area, or azagoesophageal recess. Normal junction lines, normal ref uh, uh, reflexes that should allow us to see whether or not there's actually tumor or any other kind of pathology going on. In this case here, we've got the anterior junction line by CT. You can see this is where the lungs come together, and if there were any kind of significant anterior mediastinal mass, we wouldn't be able to see that. 
In terms of the thymus, a lot of times people will ask, well, what should the normal size of the thymus be? And of course, there are these rather detailed measurements made some time ago in terms of what the width and what the thickness of a normal thymus should be. But it's easiest really to think about the thymus in terms of whether it's concave or convex, because there can be a certain amount of variation, and of course there's significant variation by age. These measurements given, I think, can be a little bit difficult to keep in your head, so if you were to look at these right here, you would probably say that this is going to be a normal thymus. It doesn't really catch your eye, but the important thing is it's concave with respect to the adjacent lung on both of these. This is a slightly younger patient. This patient is in their 40s. The thymus tending to involute for, with age still should maintain concave borders. The supraaortic region, the <clears throat> left paratracheal region, should contain things like the left subclavian artery, the uh, left superior intercostal vein, and that's something that can sometimes show or come up as an aortic nipple, the lateral, the, uh, the ladder there. This is the supraaortic area that includes the left paratracheal stripe. It's normally a little bit thicker and a little bit less defined than the right paratracheal region, but still not very thick, fades off because vessels fade off as you go superiorly, and then sort of a normal, well-defined aortic arch. This case here is a case showing an aortic nipple, which is formed by the left superior intercostal vein, where it crosses over the arch of the aorta and comes superiorly downward across in front of it. And you can see right here and right here two different presentations of an aortic nipple, not to be mistaken for any kind of adenopathy. This is what it looks like by CT. We've got the left superior intercostal vein crossing here in front of the aorta, forming our aortic nipple. And this is visualized in this case because of significant collateral flow from a very well-pressurized injection. This is another variant of normal. We've got something that's well opacified coming down towards the AP window region. And this is a left-sided SVC. You can see on both of these here. Sometimes you might see a catheter on a case, for example, an intensive care unit patient or any other patient who's had a left subclavian catheter placed where it heads directly uh, downward in front of the aorta or aortic arch. Likely, more than not, that it's going to be in a left-sided SVC rather than inside a, uh, an arterial vessel. This is another case of a left SVC in which there's a catheter. And again, you can see here, a left SVC with a catheter actually cannulating it instead of crossing over into the uh, right-sided or normal-sided SVC. The infraaortic area, or the AP window area, usually will contain some fat. It may contain the remnant of the ligamentum. It may also contain or should contain the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. We also have some posterior pleural reflections, some paraspinous lines, and also the superior pericardial recess lives in the infraaortic area. And this is something that should not be mistaken for any kind of tumor. This is the superior pericardial recess. Frequently, one might think that that might be a lymph node, but it's usually of lower density, of fluid density. It's not quite as dense as you might see perhaps a node right here. So this is the superior pericardial recess. And along here, we should see normal reflections, normal pleural reflections. And right back in here, you may see a posterior junction line. The supraazygous area contains tracheal interfaces, including the right paratracheal stripe. The right paratracheal stripe really shouldn't be any more than three or four millimeters across. You may see the posterior junction line, and this is where the azagus arch lives, and it's also the area considered the uh, venous pedicle of the heart. So right here, this is actually, I mistakenly said before, the anterior junction line. This is posterior junction line up here. The right paratracheal stripe shouldn't be more than three or four millimeters at best. It should be well-defined. You can see the posterior paratracheal stripe here. <clears throat> 
and a clear anterior mediastinal compartment. So in this case, we can very easily see the arch of the azagus, well opacified in this patient because of very good uh, infusion. And here is the posterior junction line, well defined. If we had any kind of posterior mediastinal mass there, it would be difficult to see that on CR. This is a case here, a variant of normal. And this is an azagus pseudolobe, which sort of shows how an azagus pseudolobe is formed. This is the azagus arch in which during normal migration, it has actually pulled down a piece of the both visceral and parietal pleura to form this pseudolobe, called a pseudolobe because it doesn't have the normal uh, vascular or airway anatomy that you would see with a, total, with a true lobe. Sometimes we might just see this on end embedded in the lung, and this is a case where a patient was obviously sick otherwise, a patient with ARDS with a well-defined azagous pseudolobe. In the infraazagous area, we should see the azgoesophageal recess. We should see an esophageal pleural stripe. And this is the uh, esophageal pleural stripe, and this whole area here should be loosened. That's the azgoesophageal recess, where a bit of right lung comes across the mediastinum against the aortic arch, uh, the descending aorta. This is an area which, if we don't have a well uh, a well-performed or good technique radiograph, you might not be able to see through, but if that were the case, we could easily miss a distal esophageal tumor or adenopathy in that kind of region. This is an example of the azagoesophageal recess. You can see here coming through and going inferiorly, this should always be very concave as we look at it from the right, and this is a good indication that there isn't any kind of subcrinal lymphadenopathy or any kind of abnormality associated with the distal esophagus. Right here, you can see the uh, esophagopleural stripe, and what this is, is this is a bit of lung outlined by the edge of the esophagus, and then air in the esophagus, you can see both walls of the esophagus there. It's a good indication that there's not any kind of disease in the distal or in the uh, mid-esophagus here. So this is an area here where we can see some IVC anomalies. I don't know if anybody can quickly guess what's going on here, but we've got a very distended azagous arch. And as we go inferiorly, we don't see a very well-defined IVC. But what we do see is azagous and hemiazagous here, very thick azagous, and then nothing in the liver, but a very well-defined uh, azagous system in the upper abdomen. And so this is a case of uh, IVC interruption with azagous uh, uh, continuation. Looking at the hyla, we want to make sure that we can see easily both the bronchi, the main stem bronchi. We want to be able to clearly identify left and main pulmonary arteries and have a good idea of what those calibers should be, and also be able to see uh, right and left interlobar arteries and the right superior pulmonary vein, left main bronchus, posterior wall of the bronchus intermedius. These are all normal structures that we should be able to identify and know whether or not there's any kind of disease or pathology there. So looking at the hyla here, we can see they look of normal caliber. This is the right descending pulmonary artery, which shouldn't be more than maybe 15, 16 millimeters across. Any kind of increased diameter there can be an indication of hypertension or pulmonary arterial hypertension. On the lateral view, we should see a normal right pulmonary artery in front, a left pulmonary artery behind. We don't see the left real well here, but we shouldn't see any filling in below of any kind of adenopathy which can occur either in the hyla or in the subcrinal area that would show up in this area. You can probably see a very dense or a very loosened area right here, not quite as well seen on end, which is the uh, left upper lobe pulmonary, uh, left upper lobe bronchus. Below that, it should be nice and clear. And down here, we can see the walls of the bronchus intermedius, which shouldn't be very thick at all because those can be an indication of adenopathy. 
So looking forward to mediastinal and hyalur pathology, we're going to talk about mediastinitis, we're going to talk about pneumomediastinum, and then about some mediastinal masses as well as some hyalur disease. First looking at mediastinitis, there's an acute mediastinitis and then there's chronic mediastinitis. And acute mediastinitis is usually pretty bad. It's usually bacterial and frequently is, is, uh, is uh, lethal. Chronic mediastinitis, on the other hand, is more of an insidious process, which can be idiopathic, but oftentimes is associated with TB, sometimes histo, and can lead to SVC syndromes. It can also be associated with fungal infections. An acute mediastinitis can be the result of an esophageal perforation, which could be from tumor. It could be from instrumentation, either an esophagoscopy or a mediastinal uh, or a mediastinoscopy. Sometimes it can be spontaneous for those people who are out late the night before. Borhoff syndrome associated with, uh, I guess, acute vomiting, or it can be a complication of surgery. This is a case here of a acute mediastinitis in which this patient was uh, treated for, uh, this was a patient who had tumor and they had a catheter placed and this was done in an outside hospital. The patient was transferred into us, which is always a nice way to introduce cases where you think things really went bad in an outside hospital. And this is the catheter right here. This was thought to have gone into a vascular location, but instead the catheter had perforated and was terminating in the, in the mediastinum, and through this, the patient was given chemotherapy. This resulted in a terrible mediastinitis, which uh, was more of a chemical mediastinitis rather than any kind of uh, infectious mediastinitis. And you can see that there's a loss of normal planes of tissue, just sort of a diffuse, almost inhomogeneous or heterogeneous fluid throughout the mediastinitum, uh, mediastinum there. And so this is an acute mediastinitis from uh, intervention. This here was a <clears throat> surgical complication in which there was a large fluid collection from a uh, esophageal perforation which had collected anteriorly into the left here and you can see now it's drained out and so this is a mediastinitis, an acute mediastinitis from complication from intervention. Other kinds of inflammation which can occur in the mediastinum include the esophageal region. And here we've got an esophagus which is thick. It has some debris in it and it has some irregular walls. And this is a patient who has a uh, candida esophag uh, esophagitis. This is a patient with HIV. And so we've got a infectious type of esophagitis with debris inside and some irregularity of the esophageal wall. Chronic sclerosing mediastinitis is something that we can see with histo, we can see with mycobacterium TB. It can be very slowly progressive, but the problems with it is it can lead to significant uh, obstruction of the SVC and can oftentimes be mistaken for diffuse adenopathy. It can also be uh, related to retroperitoneal fibrosis. This is a case of fibrosine mediastinitis. This is where we've got some sort of lobulated thickening of the, uh, I guess, upper right paratracheal area. But in contrast to simple adenopathy, you don't really see d d discrete nodes in here. It's more of just a diffuse lobulated thickening. This patient also had a pleural effusion on the right. But you can see that there's significant compression, if not obliteration, of the normal vascular structures. In terms of mediastinal masses, I guess ever since medical school we've heard about, you know, four categories of mediastinal masses, which include thyroid, thymoma, teratoma, and lymphoma. Um, in terms of thymic lesions, we can see thymic hyperplasia, thymolipoma, thymic cysts, thymic carcinoma, um, and it's sort of a, a bit of a laundry list, but it's important just to recognize that 
it's not just simply a thymoma that you might be seeing in the uh, anterior mediastinum. We can also see germ cell neoplasms, teratoma, seminomas. Thyroid tissue. Thyroid tissue is something which can be difficult to really classify in terms of whether it's malignant or not. We can say whether or not there's a goiter, but it's hard really to say whether or not when we see a goiter, whether or not it's malignant or not. And that holds true also for those uh, thyroid extensions down into the substernal, retrosternal region. Lymphoma, one of the most common things to be seen in terms of tumor in the mediastinum. We can have both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then other soft tissue tumors become a little bit uh, less common, lipomas and sarcomas. So this is a case here of a thymoma. And it's not real large, but you can see that the, the borders are no longer concave relative to the lung adjacent to it. And this is also a little bit lower than one might expect for a thymoma. This is another case of a thymoma. While the size is important, you can see that the real telling factor is that we've lost the concave uh, aspect relative to the lung. So we've actually got convex borders, and this is somewhat lobulated here. So these are two cases of thymoma. Thymoma is the most, <clears throat> second most common, common neoplasm after lymphoma. Of course, the other things fall off pretty far in terms of uh, frequency. A thymoma can be benign or malignant, which is usually judged by how invasive it is in terms of re uh, adjacent structures. Usually seen in middle-aged adults, it may calcify. And the relationship with myasthenia is such that some patients with myasthenia may have a thymoma and may benefit from resection. Some patients with myasthenia may not clearly have a thymoma and still benefit from resection of the thymus. Not all patients with a thymoma are going to have a uh, presentation of myasthenia, however. Now, this is a little bit different. This is a teratoma, which is a little bit irregular, but you can see that there's not only some calcification in it, but there's some lower density in it as well, some fat density. So this is a case of an anterior mediastinal mass, which is a teratoma. Teratomas are uncommon. They can be cystic or benign, uh, cystic and benign. They may calcify. They may become malignant over time. You can make a confident diagnosis if you see within it clearly, you know, tooth or bone material or fat, which we didn't see in ours. And uh, I think that wraps it up pretty much for teratoma. This is a case here of a <clears throat> retrosternal thyroid, or multinodular goiter, which is extended deep into the mediastinal region. You can see here on the radiograph that we've got a resection of the right side of the thyroid already, and we've got significant deviation of the trachea from the large left-sided mass towards the right. As we get further down in it here, you can see that it's, in, it's uh, inhomogeneous. We've got this large low-density area in it. It's got some uh, calcification. We don't you know, readily see the left innominant vein crossing uh, in front of it. And so this is not only a large retrosternal goiter, but it's also one that's causing some vascular compromise. Thyroid tumors, we can have a multinodular goiter, which can have punctate or coarse ring-like calcifications. It's frequently right-sided. It can be contiguous with the thyroid superiorly, and scintigraphy is really the best way to make the diagnosis. A certain percentage of these are going to be malignant, and we really can't tell whether something is going to be malignant or not by CT. In middle mediastinal masses, the most common things we're going to see are adenopathy from either lymphoma or Hodgkin's, metastases are frequent, sarcoid can be a very common cause of mediastinal masses or mediastinal adenopathy. Other less common things include things like angiofollicular lymph, uh, lymph node hyperplasia, or Castleman's disease, or can be infectious. 
Less common things will include, for example, a, uh, the last thing on the list there, a uh, chemodectoma. Middle mediastinal masses include things like <coughs> bronchial cysts, AP window or uh, aorticocardiophrenic uh, angle masses might include a uh, pleuropericardial fat pad or an epicardial cyst, morgagni hernias, or sometimes mistaken for main pulmonary artery enlargement, one might think is a mediastinal mass. Lymph node enlargement. Here we can see lobulated adenopathy. This is really a cluster of nodes here in the low right paratracheal region, also crossing over into the left right paratracheal region, almost into the AP window. This is the most common type of thing that we'll see in the patients that we review in terms of uh, mediastinal masses. This is another area of an significant uh, adenopathy, actually, uh, in the prevascular area as well as the right paratracheal region. Again, the most common mediastinal mass we're going to see is going to be adenopathy. Middle mediastinal masses also include things like this. This is a large bronchial cyst which can have many different locations. Here we see one in the sort of almost the uh, prevascular region, almost as if arising from the AP window. We can see things almost anywhere that's contiguous with the mediastinum, like this here, which is another large bronchial cyst, contiguous with the subcrinal area. The most common region for a bronchial cyst is going to be the subcrinal area. This here is a pericardial fat pad or is called technically a pleuropericardial fat pad, most common here, we're seeing it on the right side. And over here, on this side, this is a pericardial cyst. So it can look very similar to the uh, pericardial fat pad. <clears throat> Usually the difference in density is what's going to tip the, uh, the scales. This is a patient here who's got bilateral media, uh, hyalur adenopathy, symmetric hyalur adenopathy, uh, which almost is synonymous with sarcoid, and it's a good example of what hyalur adenopathy can look like on the lateral view. This is the left upper lobe bronchus, which is directed towards us, we see on end on, and we can see below there's just too much adenopathy, too much soft tissue below. So the lateral, very good place to look for adenopathy. In addition, we've got this large area of adenopathy here, we've got adenopathy posteriorly, and then of course we've got significant adenopathy in the right paratracheal region, shouldn't be more than a few millimeters, as I said before, as well as the AP window. So this is a good example of mediastinal and hyalur adenopathy as seen on a uh, chest radiograph, but being symmetric bilateral tips us off that this is most likely sarcoidosis. A few other things to throw in here, this is a thymolipoma. This can occur almost anywhere contiguous with or contiguous with the uh, thymic region. It's a thymic lipoma because it's got a large fat component. It's got a uh, few areas of calcification. And so this is a thymolipoma. Other areas, the mediastinum, that can be mistaken for uh, mediastinal disease or tumor, in a case, case like this, this is a large, very ectatic and dilated uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm. You can see it comes all the way across here and down. Unlikely, I think most of us would mistake this for tumor, but one could ex possibly think that's a large mediastinal mass. Of course, the aorta is in the mediastinum and so counts in there in terms of mediastinal pathology. And then wrapping up quickly in terms of the posterior mediastinum, most of these things are going to be neural in origin. Sometimes may be associated with the esophagus. Sometimes we might see extramedullary hematopoiesis. This is a case here of a 
posterior mediastinal mass, neural in origin, a schwannoma. You can see both on the MR and on the CT. It's in the uh, paraspinous area. And then wrapping up here, a distal esophageal tumor. This is a distal esophageal carcinoma. You can see bulging out here. Again, important to be able to recognize the normal reflections on a radiograph. If we'd been able to see through here, we would have seen a normal azagoesophageal recess area. It would be unlikely that we would have had this kind of tumor in this region here. For the next talk, uh, I'm going to address a different kind of an issue, which is portable chest radiography. And uh, this doesn't get very high priority in many departments. It seems like reading portable chest x-rays is on a par with taking out the garbage. And uh, I think this is partly because there's very little attention given to quality in portable radiography. I'll just say a couple of words about that. But I'm also going to focus on just a lot of kind of ant minis that, uh, in my experience, are commonly misdiagnosed, even by experienced readers, just because they aren't recognized. So hopefully, uh, having seen them, one will be able to do better next time. Obviously, there are basic differences between portables and erect chest x-rays. And a lot of these relate to the patient situation, not being standing, generally in a sitting or semi-erect posture, not having well-expanded lungs, and often not able to cooperate, even with the best of intentions. And then there are the technical differences. And these aren't just limited to the characteristics of the machine itself, though it does tend to have much longer exposures, which, as we'll see, can degrade image quality. But a major problem is the variation in the distance and alignment, because there's basically no connection between the x-ray tube and the receptor, whether it's a digital or a film screen system. So consistency tends to be an issue. <clears throat> and uh, one reason for emphasizing these technical issues is that they can affect the image quality and they can lead to pitfalls. So uh, here is one such pitfall that, that's clearly a technical issue, but one sees misdiagnosed commonly, which is a, an apparent either unilateral hyperlucency or unilateral diffuse opacity, depending on how one sees it. And clearly, this is a pretty obvious case, and it would be an error to ascribe this to lung disease or pleural disease, though one sees this all the time. And many of you will realize that this is caused by grid cutoff, uh, where the grid is not correctly aligned uh, on that side of the radiograph. And the key is, of course, to notice that the opacity is not confined to the lung. If you think there's unilateral pulmonary opacity, always check the soft tissues in the shoulder area and compare across the two sides. Uh, so while theoretically this could be a soft tissue problem, it clearly is not a lung or a pleural problem. Most departments don't actually use a grid, <clears throat> and you won't encounter grid cutoff, of course, if you don't use a grid, but what you will encounter is chest x-rays that barely have any mediastinal visibility or retrocardiac or retrodiaphragmatic visibility, generally very low contrast, and something like this. This is actually taken with a misaligned grid where there's a lot of scatter. The end result is pretty similar to not using a grid at all. Uh, last time there was a survey done, it was estimated that about 85 to 90 percent of hospitals in the United States do not use an anti-scatter grid for adult chest radiography, which is pretty incredible. Many departments that have started using digital systems have realized that digital CR plates are actually even more susceptible to scatter because they're susceptible to low energy radiation. So they've started using grids, and generally they've been astonished by the improvement in quality. But believe me, if as radiologists you aren't really behind this effort and enthusiastic about it, it's not going to happen because it's clearly more effort for technologists. Um, here's the same heavy patient radiographed with a misaligned grid and with an accurate grid, which is pretty comparable to without a grid and with a grid. And with a well-aligned grid, you expect to see good detail in the mediastinum and lungs, including seeing upper lumbar vertebrae clearly on a portable chest x-ray. Um, it's not magic. It requires generally vertical alignment of the grid rather than transverse alignment. I'd be happy to talk to you, uh, any of you, about this later if you're interested in introducing grids in your department. But on the other hand, if you do use a grid, it's important that the beam be accurately aligned with it. If it's at an angle, you're going to get cut off, which may be unilateral or diffuse and will 
certainly interfere with diagnosis. Um, all of our chest x-rays are by no means perfect, but a large majority of them are good, I would say, and in many cases we have difficulty telling just from the quality whether it's portable or upright, and I think our upright quality is good. This is the same patient, PA, portable chest x-ray. Certainly there are differences in position and projection, but the actual quality of the image is essentially identical. Now, there are some other practical issues in terms of technique, uh, particularly if you're using a digital system. Uh, you may notice if you've changed from film to digital recently that you're getting some um, soft, fuzzy-looking images. And here's an example where it, you might think it's overall an acceptable image. You have got an AICD pacemaker device and you have a swan line, but the tip of the swan line isn't visible. Clearly, we like to see catheters on portable radiographs. Here's a close-up view. So the swan line just sort of fades out somewhere in the heart at this point. Um, the number here refers to the sensitivity number on the Fuji system. You may be using AGFA or Kodak or other kinds of CR. They all have some measure of exposure, which is usually printed on a hard copy. If you're not printing hard copy, you may have to go to the uh, QA console to find out what it is. But basically, this number in the Fuji system is inversely proportional to the exposure. Once it gets below 100, it indicates a very high exposure would render a regular film pretty black and unreadable. So technologists tend to overexpose when they change to a digital system because they find the density doesn't change and they find they don't have problems with image noise. But the downside is on a portable exam, a, a heavier exposure, a larger exposure tends to mean a longer exposure. Here's the same exam repeated with a lower exposure about half the exposure, giving a higher S number, now we can clearly see the swan gas catheter. So a lower MAS, lower radiation dose, tends to be good, not only from the point of view of radiation, but from the point of view of image quality. Here's uh, the, the same case showing the long exposure and the slow exposure side by side. Um, sharper image invariably in the case of the lower dose exposure. So. Bear those technical issues in mind, especially if you're changing to a CR system. Let's look a little bit about some projection and position variations. Well, probably one of the commonest issues in portable radiography is, does the patient have pulmonary edema or are they just obese and underinflated? And it can be very difficult to make a hard and fast decision. I, I tend to uh, insist in our department that we use specific and objective criteria for diagnosing pulmonary edema. If we can't see septal lines, we can't see pleural effusions, if we have a sharp hemidiaphragm, if we have sharp uh, interpleural fissures, we don't call pulmonary edema. And I think with experience, this is obviously a case of underinflation rather than pulmonary edema. Fortuitously, the cardiophrenic angle was cut off, uh, costophrenic angle was cut off on this side. The, the exposure was immediately repeated within a few minutes with better inflation as it happened, and basically we have an expiration-inspiration pair side by side. And while there is cardiomegaly, there clearly is no sign of pulmonary edema on the second radiograph. Good, deep costophrenic angles, no sign of effusion, no sign of edema. So be careful about overcalling pulmonary edema on patients who are underinflated. If in doubt, recommend an erect PA and lateral radiograph. Another example of the extreme variations, both in inflation and in geometry, uh, this patient had a portable chest x-ray in the emergency room. It was repeated within an hour, and this is what it looked like. Um, not only does the overall shape of the chest look different, and believe me, this is the same patient. Uh, we have had cases that are misidentified, but, but this is not one. Um, this is a case that was repeated with a longer tube film distance so that there's both less magnification and there's greater lung inflation. So this is just an extreme example of the differences that you can see with portable radiography with differences in geometry and technique. Because the patient isn't fixed, their position is going to change, and one of the changes is going to be rotation. And I think you'll recognize this as a rotated mediastinum, not to be mistaken for a mediastinal mass. And Dr. Montner talked about the anatomy of the mediastinum, and you'll recognize this as a tortuous aorta with a prominent ascending and descending aorta, 
that is accentuated by rotation because now we see the spinous process projected over the head of one of the clavicles. When the exam is repeated with a straight projection, actually slightly rotated in the opposite direction, the width of the mediastinum returns to normal. So this is purely a projectional artifact. And you can imagine in the first case, it's as though you're looking at the patient in this dimension, which tends to emphasize the width of the aortic arch. In the second case, you're looking along the arch. So be very careful about rotation in diagnosing mediastinal masses or indeed aneurysms. And if you compound that with a supine position, and very often portables are going to be supine or semi-erect, which you can predict from the breast position here, breasts are projected laterally, no air in the gastric fundus. In this situation, the mediastinal veins tend to be distended. There is a tendency to be concerned about an abnormal wide mediastinum in this situation. And it can be a difficult distinction. Uh, one helpful finding is to see the upper margin of the aorta intact, as you see here, no sign of an apical cap, and a transparent opacity lateral to the paratracheal stripe here. Mediastinal hematoma, for instance, due to trauma, is not going to be transparent. It's going to be very dense because it extends from front to rear. Uh, this is also somewhat rotated, which emphasizes this appearance. The same patient, a repeat exam here with rotation in the opposite direction, here showing some spurious unilateral hyperlucency due to differences in soft tissue. Now the mediastinum is clearly within normal limits. Again, this is a rotational artifact. In a patient with an actual mediastinal hematoma, this is a post-op cabbage. It's really a very different kind of appearance, and not only in terms of the contours of the upper mediastinum, but particularly the amount of opacity. Compare the opacity here to that in the previous case. Compare the opacity here to even the area of the right atrium. This is extremely opaque. There is no visible paratracheal stripe. This is sharply defined, continues upwards. We've totally lost the upper margin of the aortic arch. Now, some degree of hematoma is pretty routine after cardiac surgery, but this would be considered abnormal. And this should not be confused, obviously, with just distension of mediastinal vessels. It's too opaque, it's too wide, it's clearly pathological. Now, compare that with a pre-op portable on the same patient. You can define a paratracheal stripe, and you can, to some extent, define the upper margin of the aorta, and the lung is coming nicely in here against the superior mediastinum. Another case of a post-op bleed, widening of the paratracheal stripe. When these bleeds are severe, they will tend to extend up over the apex of the lung, stripping the pleura off and producing the so-called apical cap that you see here. And an exam the next day shows an increase in the extent of the hematoma with an apical cap, typical of hemorrhage from the mediastinum extending over the top of the lung, not to be mistaken for a loculated pleural effusion. different kind of uh, projectional variation I want to talk about, and I'm not aware that this has actually been described per se in the literature, but like a lot of things, we just experience it from day to day and learn to recognize it, hopefully. This is a portable chest x-ray on 15th of January on a patient with some pulmonary edema and pleural effusions. Here's a radiograph the next day. <laughs> There's an apparent change. We've completely lost the outline of both hemidiaphragms. The tendency is to call this a change in the patient with an increase in pleural effusions. Here's a radiograph a few days later. Now, perhaps effusions could have increased and decreased. However, there's an explanation for this that's nothing to do with the change in the patient's condition. This is a projectional difference. Look at the clavicles. Look at the degree of lordosis on the first projection. Look at the relatively anti-lordotic projection. In the second radiograph, lordotic again. Lordotic projection, we're contiguous with the anterior part of the hemidiaphragm. Anti-lordotic, we're looking down there posteriorly into those costophrenic angles. Let me show you another example of the same thing. Patient on 3.9. This is one that uh, we did last month. Very poor definition of the hemidiaphragms, pleural effusions and pulmonary edema. Here we are on 3.10. Suddenly, the right hemidiaphragm is sharp again. Here we are on 3.11. We've lost the hemidiaphragms again patient getting better, then worse, then better again on 312? I doubt it. Uh, what's going on here is 
a regular variation in the patient's position. Perhaps these exams were done by different technologists. When you see the hemidiaphragms disappear on a day-to-day -day basis, look at the difference in projection by measuring the number of ribs projected above the clavicle. This is extremely anterolordotic. This is relatively normal projection, strongly anterolordotic, relatively normal. Notice in the anterolordotic projections, we're losing the hemidiaphragms. The reason, of course, is when you have an anterolordotic projection, you're contiguous with a more posterior part of the diaphragm, and this is where the pleural effusion and the consolidation tends to be. So don't fall into the trap of calling it a worsening in pleural effusions or basilar consolidation when you have this kind of variation. Hard to be sure that there's no change, but at least be aware that the difference in projection is capable of doing this in and of itself. Let's say a little bit about fluid collections on portable chest x-rays. Those are another source of confusion. Here we have a pretty large pleural effusion that's layered out. This is a semi-erect projection, so of course we're looking through a fair amount of pleural effusion here. The effusion probably extends up to somewhere about this level. As usually of underlying opacity and consolidation, one hears clinicians ask, is there an infiltrate, quote unquote, a word that we're no longer allowed to use, under the pleural effusion. Well, of course there is going to be consolidation with a large effusion just due to mechanical compression and atelectasis. It's inevitable. So seeing air bronchograms under a pleural effusion isn't unexpected and does not imply pneumonia or a separate process. The same patient in a supine position, the effusion layers out, it extends right over the apex. Is there a change in the size of the effusion? I don't know. Um, I don't think there's any way to tell within very broad limits when you've got this kind of a change in the patient position. This is even independent of projection. This is just the position of the patient in terms of erect versus supine that's going to have a drastic effect on the appearance of the pleural effusion. A case here with a hazy opacity over the upper lobe, radiolucency above that. What is this? Is this a pneumonia? Is it consolidation due to something else. We do have some pleural effusion at the base. Difficult to say. This was done in a semi-erect position with the typical sort of 45 degree x-ray projection that we see in portable x-rays. Here's the same patient, a repeat exam, the same day with a horizontal x-ray beam. It was done as a portable but deliberately with horizontal beam. Now we have an obvious hydropneumothorax, which was actually here. So this is a reminder that we shouldn't ever expect to see air fluid levels on portable chest x-rays because portable chest x-rays of necessity rarely have a horizontal x-ray beam. So you can't expect to see an air fluid level, but you will see one on an erect chest x-ray that's done with the patient standing because then the beam will be horizontal. And you can achieve a horizontal beam uh, in, with the patient in bed if the patient can sit upright, but it's not the usual practice. So be aware that you're missing that information. Again, the difference in projection of the beam, as shown in the diagram here, accounts for that difference. You can get some strange appearances, obviously, with pleural effusions. I think you'll all recognize this as loculated fluid in the minor fissure, sharply defined, slightly elliptical appearance, and there's other associated pleural effusion as a tip-off. And of course, if you have the luxury of a lateral view, you can see the distribution of the fluid extending both into the minor and the major fissures. It can be extremely mass-like, uh, very commonly seen when an effusion is resolving and uh, decreasing rather than when it's developing. You can also get a characteristic appearance like here when you have fluid loculated in the major fissure, <coughs> and this is a large amount of fluid that's posteriorly in the major fissure, and it can also produce this well-defined opacity not to be mistaken for a mass. Here's a specific pitfall that I like to show because it's often not recognized. It's actually not very unusual. I think when you see it, you may recognize it as something that you've seen in your practice. This is a patient who came in with pneumonia in the right lower lobe, extensive airspace disease, there's some volume loss because this is an outline of a thickened major fissure. Uh, some days later, developed fluid overload has a swan line in place as diffuse edema, but there was concern about this discrete radiolucency projected lateral to the right hilum. And the concern was that this could represent perhaps a lung abscess, 
and uh, that it needed to be worked up further. But in fact, this is just a fairly striking example of something that one sees on a regular basis on portable chest x-rays. And if I show you another patient with a somewhat similar finding, you may recognize what's going on here. Uh, this is a patient with a pleural effusion. I think you'll recognize that there's fluid tracking up along the fissure. Therefore, this would be the superior segment of the lower lobe. It's partly collapsed because we're seeing the fissure end on, and it's being outlined by the pleural effusion. Here's yet another patient with the same phenomenon, a larger effusion collapsing most of the lower lobe, but outlining the aerated superior segment. We put these side by side. You can appreciate, although these are different patients, there's a sort of a progression of the same phenomenon. So in fact, what this case represents is aerated superior segment of the lower lobe, partly outlined by fluid and consolidation in the rest of the lung. Uh, again, something that can be recognized with experience, usually fairly sharply defined lateral border, sometimes more ill-defined medially. This will change from hour to hour and day to day, depending on the patient's position. This was once described as the incomplete fissure sign um, I don't agree personally that it's due to an incomplete fissure. I don't think you need an incomplete major fissure to see it. And when we see it on CT scans, it looks like this. And I think it's pretty clear that this radiolucency that we're seeing on the chest X-ray corresponds to the superior segment of the lower lobe outlined by pleural effusion. The incomplete part of the fissure is here, but you're not actually seeing that directly on the frontal projection. Let's say a little bit about air collections, <clears throat> and uh, these are obviously on port important on portable chest x-rays in particular because these patients may have acute problems. Some of the most important air collections we see actually are not in the chest, although we're talking about chest here. It's important to advert to the fact we see a lot of the abdomen on portable chest. Um, here we've got some radiolucency faintly under the hemidiaphragm, could easily be overlooked. On uh, digital images, especially when we're reading with soft copy, we have the opportunity to window it down so that we can see these things more clearly. And this patient is actually a large amount of free interperitoneal air, but again, because it's not a horizontal X-ray beam, it can be quite subtle. This is another example of a patient with free interperitoneal air on a semi-erect portable chest X-ray, just subtle radiolucency beneath the hemidiaphragm, outlining the inferior surface of the hemidiaphragm. An erect chest X-ray on the patient, same day, and we see a large amount of free air is actually easily visible with the horizontal X-ray beam. So be very alert for subtle radiolucency on semi-erect chest X-rays. Uh, if a portable chest X-ray is requested to, quote, rule out free air, usually recommend that they do a decubitus view of the abdomen where, where there will be at least a horizontal X-ray beam. Pneumothorax, easy to see with a good quality portable chest, and especially when the pleura is thickened, such as here. A larger pneumothorax with some degree of collapse of the lung, and this patient has stiff lungs, so they've not collapsed completely, and there's probably some degree of tension developing here. And this would be an example of a fairly extreme tension pneumothorax in a patient who has several bullet injuries. You see shift of the mediastinum and depression of the hemidiaphragm. We're not going to miss these. The issue here is usually communicating in a prompt fashion with the uh, clinical team and making sure that they're aware of the situation. Uh, the deep sulcus sign is a clue to the presence of pneumothorax at the lung base. And if the patient has a pacified lung, the pneumothorax is so obvious, you don't really need the deep sulcus sign to detect the pneumo. On the other hand, this is a much more subtle example, and this is where the deep sulcus sign is useful. You just have a vague radiolucency in the area of the lung base, and the sulcus seems to be extending down rather far and to be rather sharply defined. And that's I think a good example of when the deep sulcus sign is a clue to the presence of a subpulmonic pneumothorax. And indeed, the next day on this patient, we had a complete pneumothorax with collapse of the lung. And in retrospect, it certainly was present at this time. And the, at this point, the chest tube has been inserted and the lung has re-expanded. So um, do pay attention to that sign, and perhaps a decubitus view would have clarified the situation. 
The other way that we can miss a pneumothorax is if it's loculated anteriorly. Uh, this is partly subpulmonic. Notice lung markings are extending to the edge, but there's just a lot of radiolucency. There's shift of the mediastinum to the opposite side. This appearance should alert us to the presence of a loculated anterior and subpulmonic pneumothorax. Uh, here we have a later radiograph showing further extension of the pneumothorax, getting rather obvious now apparent pleural adhesions preventing the lung from retracting from the chest wall. Don't wait until you see air lateral to the lung. You may never see it if the patient has pleural adhesions. Here the uh, chest tube uh, pleurovac has been inserted and the mediastinum has returned to a normal position. Look at the dramatic change between the tension present at the right base here and the normal situation on the, after the tube has been inserted. Pneumothorax can be extremely subtle in young patients, and this isn't necessarily about portable exams, but I'm just going to mention it in passing. This is a patient we had in the last two weeks, uh, had a history of trauma rule out pneumothorax. Well, here's the right lung apex. Um, this is a good quality film. It's very hard to see, and you probably will have to take my word for it, but believe me, there is a pneumothorax there, but young patients sometimes such, have such a fine visceral pleural line that it's almost impossible to resolve. So we certainly are not going to see that unless we look for it very, very diligently. Um, this is something could be confused with a subpulmonic pneumothorax. It's a lot more unusual. This is an air collection that developed overnight in a patient with ARDS on mechanical ventilation under pressure. It's a discrete air collection at the base we see on the lateral view, it's rather more spherical than you expect even a loculated pneumothorax to be. I don't know if any of you have seen a case like this. Usually it occurs at the lung base or along the fissures, typically in patients who are being ventilated at high pressures. Well, this is a subpleural air cyst, and this is a case of air dissecting into the subpleural area after rupture of alveoli under high pressure they will commonly convert to a pneumothorax. So that's the main significance of the finding. Typically, air in the interstitial tissues dissects back to the mediastinum. We end up with mediastinal emphysema and sub-Q emphysema, but it can go the other way and convert to a pneumothorax. A couple of other quick pitfalls, an air collection to the right of the mediastinum. This is a patient who had a gastric interposition. This is a distended intrathoracic stomach not to be mistaken for a medial pneumothorax. This is an unusual radiolucency projected over the mediastinum. This is characteristic of a patient with an open sternotomy wound. Uh, this patient had uh, infected sternotomy and the sutures have been removed. There is an open wound, so um, something that one can recognize with experience. Skin folds, again, not to be mistaken for pneumothorax. Generally, there are lung markings extending laterally. Generally, these are multiple, and generally, they are not reproducible from one examination to another. It's a matter of suspecting it and recognizing the typical features. Air can get outside of the pleura and can simulate a pneumothorax in patients with subcutaneous emphysema. This looks very like a pneumothorax, except that it's a little more irregular and the pleura is a bit thicker, and the patient has extensive sub-Q air. This is, in fact, extrapleural air that stripped the parietal pleura off the chest wall, almost always associated with mediastinal air and subcutaneous air. It remains loculated. It doesn't move around freely. And it usually, at least in our experience, doesn't get to be very large, but does not require a chest tube. The only time I've noticed it on a chest x-ray was this patient with a hemothorax after a stab wound. This is the blood in the pleural space. This air is clearly outside of the parietal pleura. So extrapleural air, not to be confused with pneumothorax. And uh, finally, a couple of other air collections that we see and which are sometimes misinterpreted. This is a patient also being ventilated, a patient with ARDS, air collection along the mediastinum extending below the base of the heart. This is usually misinterpreted as pneumopericardium, but actually extensive mediastinal emphysema will extend below the base of the heart. That's been called the continuous diaphragm sign, shown very nicely here. This air is outside the pericardium, and of course pericardial air will end at the upper margin of the pericardium. This is due to barotrauma in this case, and usually it will decompress. 
On the other hand, pneumopericardium is usually in adults post-surgical or post-traumatic. And this is a very nice example extending to the upper margin of the pericardium after an intrapericardial pneumonectomy with the section of the pulmonary veins which allows air into the pericardium. Notice the thickness of the combined pericardium on pleura is a little more than you'll see in mediastinal emphysema. <clears throat> and uh, this is the final phenomenon I'm going to mention. Again, a pitfall, a radiolucency running alongside the heart in this close-up view of the left lower lobe, often called a pneumomediastinum, but it's not. Notice the line extends superiorly here. Notice there's consolidation behind the heart. Previous day's radiograph is a clue. This is typical atelectasis of the lower lobe. This is the outline of the major fissure. As the major fissure moves laterally and the lower lobe starts re-aerating, we see that major fissure end on, and our radiographic projection projects lateral to the left heart border, and it simulates a pneumomediastinum. Here's another case, looks very similar, a partially collapsed lower lobe, an end on major fissure running alongside the heart, simulating a pneumomediastinum. Also confirmed here on the CT scan, end on major fissure, partly collapsed lower lobe. And occasionally seen on the right side also, this is a partly collapsed right lower lobe, thickened fissure, moves medially and downwards, projects alongside the heart. The next topic is going to be lung disease in the immune compromised patient. This is a pretty large topic. And we're going to be discussing disease not only in the AIDS HIV population, but also in those that are post transplant on chemotherapy and those that have a relative immune compromise, such as patients that are on chronic steroid therapy. <clears throat> Excuse me, opportunistic disease can uh, encompass both infection, uh, most commonly it's going to be bacterial, but we can also see mycobacterial viral, fungal, and protozoan, which we'll cover today, and also malignancies, um, sarcoma, lung cancer, and also lymphoproliferative disorders. Uh, bacterial and mycobacterial are going to be uh, fairly common uh, opportunistic infections that we see in our practice, and those are the first topics that we'll discuss. Bacterial, by far, remains the most common you often hear the phrase, uh, common things are most common. Keep that in the back of your mind before jumping to other diagnoses. Also cover tuberculosis, mycobacterium, avium complex, and uh, other entities uh, such as nocardia. Tuberculosis, uh, we all are taught in uh, school that primary TB is an inhaled bacillus that forms a primary gone complex. On the chest radiograph, this can be see as a, seen as a focal area of opacity with hyalur adenopathy. In a normal patient, uh, this will uh, uh, inspire a reaction that causes uh, a halt of the disease process and it'll progress to fibrosis. Uh, in the immune compromised population, however, um, this can go on uh, unhalted to uh, caseation, even a bronchopneumonia or miliary disease if it's not caught. In the setting of HIV, it's considered an AIDS-defining condition. We'll have different reaction patterns based on the CD4 count. In the CD4 above 200, you'll get a re typical reactivation pattern with involvement of the upper lobes and apical posterior segments and lower lobe superior segments. It's important to search thoroughly for the presence of cavitation as this may uh, herald disease activity and risk to others. If you're not sure that you see uh, cavitation, then ask for a CT. As the CD4 count drops, the consolidation will then become more random and the cavitation is less commonly observed and it becomes more like a primary type infection pattern. When the CD4 is below 200, this chest X-ray may be normal in up to 15%. We begin to see alveolar opacities as well as interstitial opacities, the miliary pattern with disseminated disease, and uni or bilateral lymphadenopathy. In textbooks, this is you know said to be peripheral enhancing and low density, but you know we're lucky if we see that. But it's also something to keep in mind if you see the low density peripherally enhancing nodes.
um, clinically in the effusions, unlike in the immune competent population, do have a high organism burden, so a TAP could be diagnostic in this case, and it's important to, to um, point these out to your clinicians. Uh, this is a, a typical case. We have uh, mediastinal adenopathy, and you can see on the second slide that the, oops, that the um, uh, subcarinal adenopathy is centrally of low density and has some peripheral enhancement, typical of tuberculosis, among other uh, causes. <clears throat> we uh, look on the lung windows in this patient, and we see a miliary pattern of spread with multiple small nodules. This is another patient uh, with HIV who has uh, typical upper lobe type consolidation and paratracheal adenopathy that you can see on both the PA and the lateral. And we search uh, for consolidation in all patients. And this is an example for um, some of our residents of a miliary pattern, which we, we don't see very often. Um, it's a very fine granular type uh, interstitial, it appears interstitial opacity. I'm going to show you a few more examples of it. Um, if you look on the close-up view, you can see the fine nodularity in the periphery of the lung. That's, if you're not sure about what you're looking at, that's the easiest area to look and to make sure that it's a real finding. And uh, the TB can also spread through uh, the airway. So this case is an endobronchial spread of tuberculosis. You're seeing in the region of the lingula some small nodular densities and a cavity in the left upper lobe. So here's the nodular densities in our cavity. And this is one more case that we have um, upper lobe nodular opacities and we're starting to see cavity formation. So we see in the right upper lobe, you can start to see some lucency, perhaps also in the left upper lobe, and the opacities are quite nodular and poorly defined. <clears throat> in other immune deficient states, um, it can have a different presentation. You can see disseminated infection, and you'll get a chest x-ray with multiple pulmonary nodules that may or may not be a miliary pattern. And the upper lobe predominant distribution is seen only in patients with the isolated pulmonary infection. It's important to remember that an atypical presentation is always possible. This is a uh, diabetic patient who had a non-resolving upper lobe pneumonia. We, uh, chest tube was placed. And if you look at your lower right film, you can see that there are multiple small nodules, and this turned out to be tuberculosis. The uh, effusion was tapped and was diagnostic in this case. And this is a uh, patient that is immune compromised from malignancy, and they are having an upper lobe consolidation at the apex that was non resolving, and this turned out to be tuberculosis. And this is the CT. We have a very dense consolidation with peripheral ground glass. It's fair, fairly poorly defined and extends to the chest wall. So upper lung zone consolidation should raise your awareness that this is uh, TB needs to be included in the differential. If we go on to non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections, uh, this includes mycobacterium avium complex, uh, MAI or MAC. Uh, in patients with HIV, they are prophylaxed uh, routinely for this if their CD4 count is below 50 cells per cubic millimeter. It's rare in other immune-compromised patients. Oftentimes, this can be cultured from the sputum, and it's not sure what the clinical significance of a positive sputum culture is, but they're prophylaxed because of the risk of future disseminated infection. A biopsy is uh, usually ne necessary to make a definitive diagnosis. Uh, radiography, the chest x-ray is often normal. Uh, we look for lymphadenopathy. We may or may not see cavitary nodules or diffuse or lobar alveolar or reticulonodular opacities. On CT, may or may not see bronchiectasis. Your airways disease is seen, and again, this is another cause for peripherally enhancing lymph nodes, and you can get peribronchovascular nodules. So we're used to seeing the MAI-type picture in elderly women where you get a lower lobe distribution, 
you get uh, lower lobe bronchiectasis and uh, peripheral disease. So the distribution in this uh, population is going to be somewhat different. So here's a case that um, it, there is a, a definite interstitial abnormality in the periphery of the upper lobes. It looks somewhat nodular. On our close-up view, we can see multiple small nodular densities in the periphery of the left upper lobe. And on CT, uh, it, this uh, appears as uh, peribronchial thickening and peribronchovascular nodularity in addition to a ground glass type opacity. You look at the uh, upper left film adjacent to the uh, right perivertebral area, you can see a nice example of dilatation of the airway with peribronchial thickening. So this is typical, you look for the bronchiectasis, peribronchial thickening, thickening of the airways. We have a prone view in your upper right corner where we're seeing the uh, tree and bud appearance of distal airway impaction. And this is another case where it's progressed to cause um, distal airways disease where we have air trapping and the typical uh, distal airway uh, d uh, dilatation, bronchiectasis down here. Um, so this is a fairly typical pattern that you see bronchiectasis leading into a peripheral area of consolidation and look for your tree and bud appearance. Okay, and yet another example, and we see it that it does not clear when we place the, place the patient in uh, prone positioning. Okay, nice examples of bronchiectasis. Okay, no, no cardia. Um, this is mentioned because it can be confused um, with masses in some patients on their initial radiographic uh, uh, presentation. It's a gram-positive bacteria that is spread by inhalational means. Uh, classically, it's seen in cardiac transplant patients, but can be seen with any solid organ transplant, leukemia, or lymphoma. The infection, interestingly, is seen less often in the AIDS population, and we think that uh, prophylaxis for PCP is somehow protective for the infection. This is a uh, liver transplant patient. You can see on the PA radiograph that we have a uh, mass-like opacity, and we also have enlargement of the hilar area and perhaps the subcarinal region at the CT, and we again have this massive adenopathy, low density, peripherally enhancing. So this is another point that don't jump to conclusions when you see this, because it can be seen in, in several disease entities. And we have this peripheral wedge-shaped area of consolidation and effusion. If you look closely, this consolidation looks like it's got something within it, which is low density, and this was uh, proven to be nocardia. So this uh, typically forms large airspace opacities. They can be mass-like or nodular. Get, you can get pleural effusions, lymphadenopathy, and sometimes may ca these may cavitate. Other opportunistic infections include viral. We'll go over those next. Uh, cytomegalovirus pneumonia is probably one of our most important ones. We'll also uh, touch base on uh, HSV, varicella zoster, adenovirus, measles, and Epstein-Barr virus. Cytomegalovirus has a diffuse radiographic pattern, typically interstitial. The clinical presentation is subacute with fever and non-productive cough, and the HIV patients often have systemic or disseminated disease. They present with pulmonary disease only when the CD4 count is very low, usually less than 20, and is certainly less than 100. Early on, they'll get interlobular septal and peribronchial thickening that can be nodular or miliary. Later on, it, uh, it progresses to dense airspace involvement and bilateral nodules or masses. On the CT, we look for bronchiectasis, cavitation, and bronchiolar impaction. This is a case where um, you can look that there is um, some volume loss in the right base. And in the periphery of the lung, we can see a very fine, somewhat nodular interstitial pattern. And if we look closely, we can see peribronchial thickening. Let me go back up here. You can see peribronchial thickening and bronchiectasis in the upper lung zone. So we have septal lines and 
diffuse interstitial abnormality. On the CT, um, I'm not certain how well this is projecting, but we have a very fine interstitial abnormality, and this turned out to be the, the uh, cytomegalovirus pneumonia. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about lung disease after solid organ transplant uh, as a side. Um, it's important in these cases to get uh, adequate clinical history. You may need to call the clinician and find out uh, when they were transplanted and what type of immune suppressive uh, agents they're receiving. Um, on days 0 through 30 post-transplant, the most common types of uh, pneumonia that we're going to see are secondary to aspiration or line sepsis. Uh, the immune suppression is most severe on days 30 to 120 where the T cell immunity is depressed and we'll start seeing the cytomegalovirus, PCB, uh, aspergillus nocardia, mucor, and mycobacteria. After 120 days, if the immune suppression is tapered, then they um, get a, a relatively nor normalized immunity and again start showing up with community acquired pneumonia. Otherwise, if the immune suppression is prolonged, PCP and cryptococcus uh, come into play in addition to the others. Okay, fungal infection. Uh, we see all of these in our practice. Uh, histo, aspergillus, and candida are very important. Uh, rarely we'll see cases of blasto and crypto. Opportunistic fungal pneumonia. Um, it's important to ask if your patient is neutropenic. Uh, neutropenia induced post chemotherapy in AIDS or after solid organ transplant immune suppression. Uh, after allogenic bone marrow transplant, they can get profound neutropenia up to three weeks post transplant and they're at high risk of uh, getting aspergillus. And this is a, a transplant patient who developed this nodular uh, mass like opacity. Uh, that is contiguous with the left uh, hilar region, and this ended up being aspergillus. On the CT, you can see your typical air crescent sign within the mass like opacity. Uh, again, aspergillus, you need to ask about severe or prolonged neutropenia, and there are different forms that are, uh, you should be able to recognize. Tracheobronchial aspergillus is, uh, produces invasion of the airway wall or obstruction of the lumen. Invasive aspergillus is where the hyphae invade the pulmonary arteries, leading to thrombosis, hemorrhage, necrosis, and systemic dissemination and semi-invasive or chronic necrotizing aspergillus is a slowly progressive cavitary consolidation in the upper lobes, and in these cases we'll find the intracavitary mycetoma. Uh, on the chest radiograph, uh, we look for multiple poorly defined pulmonary nodules which will coalesce over time. Early CT, you can see the CT halo sign, which is ground glass attenuation surrounding the nodules. Later on, find C cavitation and look for the air crescent sign of slough parenchyma. This is actually a good sign and indicates granulocyte recovery. Chest wall and mediastinal invasion sometimes can occur. This is a case of chronic necrotizing aspergillus. We have a patient with sarcoid with upper lung zone volume loss and uh, retraction of the hyla and they've developed this uh, very slowly resolving uh, mass-like opacity in the upper lung zone, and if you look carefully, you can see the air crescent sign. This is an, uh, another patient who uh, had lung necrosis, and they developed an intracavitary mass that was mobile upon uh, prone and uh, uh, combat positioning, and this, again, was semi-invasive aspergillus. Okay, cryptococcal pneumonia. Patients have a pro protracted course, and it can be a disseminated infection involving the CNS or bone. Uh, they have lung masses or nodules and can present with segmental or lobar consolidation. Less often, you'll see the effusions, cavitation, and adenopathy. This is a case of uh, cryptococcal pneumonia where we do have effusions and we have multiple poorly defined mass-like opacities in the periphery of the lung and near the vascular structures. It's ended up being cryptococcus. And this is another case. We have a wedge-shaped pulmonary opacity in the periphery of the lung field and ended up being cryptococcus. <clears throat> mucor. Uh, mucor is 
don't see it very often, but it's a nice diagnosis to make if you uh, see uh, some of the characteristic findings. It invades the pulmonary arteries. Uh, the patients are severely neutropenic. Typically, it's diabetics. Uh, it mimics the features of invasive aspergillus. It will cavitate, but you don't see the air crescent sign. Um, in diabetics, you get lower bar consolidation, cavitation, and abscesses, and they also get a, a pretty interesting uh, complica late complication of this infection. This is a diabetic that presented to us from an outside hospital who has this fluffy opacity in the uh, lower lobe and some en mild enlargement of the uh, left uh, pulmonary artery. So we got a CT, and indeed there's an area of consolidation, but if you look carefully, there's also this higher density abnormality centrally. If we do a serial CT. Here's the pulmonary artery coming down, and it's focally enlarging, and it goes tapers back down to its uh, normal diameter later, and this is a, a case of pulmonary artery aneurysm as a complication of, of uh, mucor which is nice to, to um, recognize this is treated effectively with uh, embolic coils, and the patient did fairly well. Okay, blastomycosis. Uh, this is an inhalational uh, spread. The organism is present in the soil, so again, the history is important. If the pa patients were camping or hunting, uh, had soil exposure, uh, this can be upper lobe consolidation that's multifocal uh, with effusion and adenopathy, can cavitate. Uh, this can be very nodular. You can see multiple small nodules that coalesce over time. Look for a destruction of the adjacent bone, and you can get hematogenous spread to the skin, bone, and GI tract. This is a case of blastomycosis where we have a uh, peripheral opacity. And on the CT, very mass-like area of consolidation, distorting the airway and extending to the pleural surface. Okay, protozoal infections. Uh, most importantly is PCP. PCP uh, is uh, obtained when the patients have impaired cell-mediated cell -mediated immunity. This can be an AIDS, uh, corticosteroid use, solid organ transplant, and bone marrow transplant. It is a high mortality rate and can be occult on chest radiograph, and you may have to get a high-resolution CT to get an accurate diagnosis. Uh, pathologically, this is a disruption of the alveolar capillary membrane. The alveolar spaces fill with fluid and debris, and you'll get a patchy upper lung zone and perihilar distribution ground glass attenuation. Uh, a host response follows, the, which uh, involves macrophage and monocyte uh, mobilization and moving into the lung interstitium, and then you'll see reticular opacities and coarsening of the interstitium. On high-resolution CT, interlobular and intralobular septal thickening are noted as the emphatics clear the pneumonia. The next phase is reparative, and you'll see interstitial fibrosis and Interestingly, previously irradiated areas of lung may appear spared. Okay, in AIDS, the CD4 is usually less than 200. It's a slow onset over weeks. You can see irregular thin-walled cysts in the areas of ground glass, and look. And uh, patients can also see uh, experience spontaneous pneumothoraces. It's a board's favorite. Uh, solid organ transplant, a little bit different. It's rare if the patient complies with their prophylaxis. The onset is rapid, and it does occur if the pro immunosuppressives are prolonged due to organ rejection, uh, usually greater than 120 days. In bone marrow transplant, the onset is uh, fairly rapid, three to four days, and rare if the patients uh, comply with their prophylaxis. They may de develop infection if they do not in uh, two the two-month period post-transplant. So we have several cases. This was a, a young woman who has basilar, very fine interstitial abnormality. Sometimes this can be extremely subtle. This is another patient with a in uh, lower lung zone interstitial abnormality involvement of the left lung. Again, very fine ground glass type in interstitial disease.
This is um, <clears throat> a patient who has had repeated bouts of disease. Um, we have uh, a more uh, chronic type appearance with a nodular, somewhat nodular interstitium, a peripheral opacity, and we're starting to see some cysts in the upper lung zone. And here's a close-up of our cyst. Okay, this is another patient who had uh, repeated bouts of PCP. They have the typical uh, appearance in the lower uh, lung zone. You know, again, look for the perihilar ground glass type lesions. But they have, they have you know, prior cystic disease, and they went on to develop a pneumothorax. And again, for you seniors, this is a pretty favorite boards case where you'll have somebody who has uh, an interstitial abnormality, PCP might come into your mind and they'll show you the follow-up and showing the pneumothorax and it's uh, pretty characteristic. Okay, uh, lastly, uh, we'll talk about malignancies that can be uh, seen in the uh, immune-compromised patient, uh, KS, um, lymphoma, uh, interestingly, in the AIDS population, it's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We can't see Hodgkin's disease and an ent entity called lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis. They also have an increased incidence of lung carcinoma and other neoplastic disease. This is a case of uh, sarcoma where we have peribronchial distribution. You can see the airway here, nodular opacities uh, throughout the lung fields. Um, this is, we usually, the radiographic diagnosis is usually made uh, relatively late in the clinical course um, as the patients have usually been bronched and they'll see endobronchial lesions um, <clears throat> at the time of uh, presentation. Um, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis is a very rare entity, but I thought you might like to see a case. Uh, usually this is a pediatric uh, diagnosis. Um, it's a, an AIDS-defining condition. It's very rare in the adult HIV population. Uh, we see bilateral reticular and nodular opacities, which represent lymphocytic proliferation in the interstitium, and small subpleural nodular opacities. EBV and the HIV uh, virus uh, infection have both been implicated. And this was uh, an adult patient who uh, was known to have uh, HIV who developed uh, these very fine nodular interstitial opacities sim fairly symmetrically throughout their lung field. We've got the CT and we have diffuse micronodules. Now this very could easily could have been something infectious and ended up being LIP. So this is just something to interesting case to keep in mind. Uh, Post-transplant uh, lymphoproliferative disease. Uh, <clears throat> we can see this in chron chronic immune suppression usually within the first year, it's possible relation to EBV. We'll look for pulmonary nodules and adenopathy. Um, I brought this up only to keep in mind uh, in your differential for a solid pulmonary nod a solitary pulmonary nodule in your transplant patient population. Um, if they're post lung transplant, this certainly always needs to be kept in mind. But also in patients with solid organ transplant, look in your images of your upper abdomen. If they have adenopathy in the upper abdomen or other disease elsewhere uh, related to their transplant organ and are presenting with a solitary pulmonary nodule, it's possible that this can be uh, related to PTLD. Okay, we have a patient here who has obvious. Uh, mediastinal adenopathy on their chest radiograph and on the CT this ended up being uh, lymphoma related. Other things just to keep in mind are HIV related adenopathy just from early in asymptomatic HIV infection that presents as generalized lymphadenopathy rarely is in the hilar mediastinal region. Uh, again, uh, AIDS patients have an increased incidence of lung cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and other neoplasm. Okay, take home points. Uh, remember that the bacterial infection is always going to be most common. Opportunistic infection can occur in the non AIDS population. Uh, you get young patients on steroids for their asthma or other diseases, they can get PCP and, or other opportunistic disease. Uh, remember that you can always have an atypical pres presentation or distribution of findings and ask for your clinical information and keep in the back of your mind the non-infectious causes. Okay, thank you very much.
Let's look first at the airways and uh, how we can image them. We'll say a little bit about imaging technique and tracheobronchial anatomy. Uh, in general, to uh, image the central airways with CT, we want to use narrow collimation, overlapping reconstruction, and single breath hold. And certainly, multi-detector CT allows us to do this very easily and routinely and to produce very nice 3D uh, reformats at a workstation. And in fact, this is one of the areas where we find that 3D reconstruction is particularly helpful. Uh, you're familiar with the central bronchial anatomy, but uh, just a few points uh, in review. Uh, there are uh, two classifications used, as you know, to name the bronchi. There's the Jackson-Huber, which is the anatomical description, such as uh, apical uh, and posterior branches and so on. And there's the Boyden classification, B1, B2, B3, uh, which is favored by some bronchoscopists because it's more cryptic. Uh, but uh, most textbooks still favor the uh, Jackson-Huber classification, so we'll use that here. The uh, points to remember as a radiologist when interpreting the airways is the important points of asymmetry and variation. So, for instance, in the right upper lobe, as you know, we have distinct apical posterior and anterior branches. Now, on the left side, we have combined apical and posterior uh, branches. We have a bronchus intermedius on the right and a separate middle lobe takeoff, whereas the corresponding lobe on the left, which would be the lingula, comes off the left upper lobe bronchus. And this has important implications for patterns of atelectasis, as we'll see later. Uh, in the basilar segments, on the left side, we commonly have the anterior and medial segments combined to give a single anteromedial segment, whereas these segments tend to be separate on the right side. But variations are, in fact, very common. Generally, we image the airway, as I said, using high-resolution uh, CT scan and overlapping reconstruction. Uh, I find that coronal and sagittal reformats are usually the most helpful. And this is an example where we can get most of the trachea on the proximal main airways in a uh, single uh, image. Sometimes we will need to uh, go off axis to continue to image the more distal parts of the airways shown here very nicely. So as you can see, we can see internal airway abnormalities pretty clearly with these kinds of images, again, acquired during a single breath hold. Generally, off-axis reconstructions can be helpful as we go further distally into the smaller airways. Here's an example where we've gone off the axial plane, tilted somewhat to follow the branches of the middle lobe, the uh, medial and lateral branches, and on the left side, the lingula we can trace pretty far distally with an off-axis reconstruction. Virtual bronchoscopy is something that clinicians occasionally request because it sounds uh, quite exotic, and I suppose it does look exotic in a sense. And this is a three-dimensional reconstruction using the bronchoscopist's perspective. I think it really just simulates that limited keyhole perspective. I, I don't think it is really any advantages for us as radiologists, except that uh, it does impress medical students and uh, it has a big so-called wow factor. So uh, we do that when people ask for it. But you have to realize that there's quite a lot of interpolation going on in generating these images, uh, a certain amount of smoothing. And uh, I, I would want to confirm any abnormalities on the axial section. The axial sections, of course, do hold all of the data. It's just easier to visualize it in a three-dimensional sense. Um, using this perspective. I think it is of some value to surgeons and bronchoscopists who are going to have to approach the lesion by a transbronchoscopic approach and perhaps to biopsy it in these cases. Uh, let's look at some abnormalities of the central airways as they uh, appear on the chest radiograph and CT. And probably statistically one of the most common is going to be displacement of the upper trachea. The, the trachea is really one of the landmarks we have in the mediastinum. And of course, since there's not much other air in the mediastinum, we generally can't see internal structures unless they're calcified. But we can use the position of the trachea as one of our kind of criteria of normality. In a case like this, the trachea has been deviated clearly from the midline to the right, 
And that would be very typical of a goiter, and Dr. Montner showed several examples of that earlier on. The trachea normally deviates somewhat to the right as it goes down around the aorta, and the more tortuous the aorta gets, the more uh, ectatic it gets, the further the deviation can be at this level. But this kind of deviation above the aorta is uh, likely due to some long-standing abnormality such as a goiter. Um, other mediastinal masses and lung volume changes can also displace the trachea from its central position. Here's a good example of where following the trachea down is going to highlight the fact that there's something going on in the upper mediastinum. <laughs> it's surprisingly how common a right aortic arch is missed, and I think if it is missed, the reader is not following the trachea down the mediastinum because here clearly the trachea is deviated towards the left side. There's just not enough space here for a normal aortic arch. There's something very large here. Could be misinterpreted as a mass, but one can follow actually the descending aorta down the right side of the mediastinum. Uh, sometimes the right side of the aorta will cross over immediately, so it may actually descend on the left side, and that isn't a necessary criterion to have a descending aorta on the right. Strictures, quite common in the upper trachea, and usually these are going to be iatrogenic. The majority of them are patients who have been intubated or have had tracheostomy tubes for a period of time. And again, this is a good application for high-resolution CT with 3D reconstruction. This is typical of a stenosis in the upper trachea. Remember, the vocal cords are at a higher level. Uh, this is asymmetrical narrowing easily overlooked on the chest x-ray. This is a patient who had a previous tracheostomy. There are three different points where stenoses are likely to occur in patients with a tracheostomy. And these are first at the stoma itself where the tube enters. Secondly, at the site of the cuff where one is more likely to see a diffuse narrowing due to mucosal ischemia, less common these days with the low-pressure cuffs. And finally, at the tip of the tube, if the tube is bearing consistently on one or other wall of the trachea, a granuloma formation and scarring can occur, and one can see some stenosis at that site. These are actually easy to miss on chest CT scans, and I think it's good to make a routine of separately running up and down, reading in soft copy, particularly running up and down through the central airways using a lung setting, which makes these abnormalities more easily noticeable. It may be only on one or two sections, and like pneumothorax on a chest X-ray, unless you look for it, you have a very high chance of overlooking it. Some patients with tracheal stenosis have carried a diagnosis of asthma, and uh, they come into hospital wheezing and are treated for asthma before it's realized that they have actually a fixed obstruction. So it's uh, sometimes an opportunity to make a real contribution to the patient's management. Again, this is a good application for 3D surface rendering. One can rotate the airway in three dimensions and appreciate the length and the severity of narrowing. And this is certainly helpful to surgeons who are planning uh, reconstruction of these abnormalities. Um, I've heard people say that they want to see the uh, inside of the trachea, not the outside. But as radiologists, of course, we realize that what's being reconstructed here is essentially the inside of the trachea in a three-dimensional space. We're looking here at the interface between the air and the soft tissues. So this is really a more useful perspective than the so-called virtual bronchoscopic perspective, which would allow us only to appreciate a small area at one time. Tumors do occur in the trachea, uh, particularly in the pediatric population. There are a fair variety of benign lesions that we see here from papillomas, through hamartomas and hemangiomas, which are actually quite common in infants, though all of these are considerably less common in adults. Um, malignant primary tracheal tumors are quite unusual compared to lung cancers, but the point to remember here is that the two commonest primary lesions by far that together account for 80% are squamous cell carcinomas and adenoid cystic carcinomas. All of the other kinds of carcinomas, lymphomas, carcinoids, can occur here. Uh, endobronchial metastases are not rare, especially renal melanoma and breast, and certainly direct invasion from lung cancer is a good deal more common than a primary malignancy of the trachea. This is a typical example of a 
lobulated, fungating lesion extending around much of the circumference of the trachea and actually partly obstructing the lesion, the uh, lumen. This is fairly typical of an adenoid cystic carcinoma, which tend to be rather lobulated, fungating lesions, uh, shown to advantage on a reconstruction here in the sagittal plane, showing the degree of luminal narrowing on the vertical extent of the lesion. Again, direct invasion is a rather more common lesion. This is a metastatic carcinoma, highly vascular lesions, one in the lung, one in the mediastinum, directly invading the right main stem bronchus and distal trachea. Again, shown very nicely on a coronal reconstruction and, of course, visible also on a virtual bronchoscopy, but a more limited viewpoint and less practical information than on the sagittal and coronal reformats. Carcinoids occur relatively commonly in the central bronchi compared to peripherally, and we talked about these briefly before. Uh, they occur in a younger age group generally than carcinomas. The majority are going to be central, and about 25 to 30 percent of visible calcification on CT tend to be bright on T2 on MR scans. The point to remember here is that a significant number of them, about 15 percent, are the so-called atypical carcinoids. And these are actually highly malignant lesions. The majority of these metastasize. They behave like small cell lung cancers. So a very different animal from the typical benign carcinoid. Here's a lesion that we saw during the past year, a patient with obstructive symptoms and a subtly abnormal chest x-ray, but a dramatically abnormal CT scan showing a large lesion growing into the distal trachea and partly obstructing the right upper lobe bronchus, shown here on a coronal reconstruction. Uh, some of the calcification here may have been pre-existing in a lymph node, um, but it's closely related to the lesion. And uh, this was a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so this is in the category probably of a lesion arising in the right main stem bronchus. I believe I showed this uh, case earlier, a typical presentation of a carcinoid with central obstruction of the left upper lobe bronchus in a young patient, partial calcification again shown on the CT scan, dilated mucus-filled bronchi, which is always suggestive of a more indolent, slow-growing lesion. You can see that with cancer, but it's a lot more common with uh, relatively slow-growing benign lesions to see these kind of bronchoceles. So these are neuroendocrine tumors, again, and majority going to be central. Let's talk a little bit about atelectasis, because that's something that's readily recognizable but yet very often misinterpreted. And this, again, is where we can make a contribution because it can make a difference to management. It can obviously be total in the sense of involving the whole lung. It can be lobar, segmental, or subsegmental. In terms of classification, there are a few different terms used. I think obstructive is more intuitive than calling it resorption atelectasis, which some people have recommended. And this would be the situation where you've got a tumor or a mucus plug or a foreign body actually obstructing the airway. Compressive is where you've got something compressing the lung externally, such as an effusion or pneumothorax. Adhesive atelectasis, you see this after radiation therapy, respiratory distress syndrome, and commonly post-op at the lung bases. And then so-called cicatrization atelectasis, secondary to pulmonary fibrosis, Let's just look at a few of these classical patterns and see what the distinguishing features are. As radiologists, we should all recognize this just from this single projection as pathognomonic of left upper lobe atelectasis. Why? We've complete obliteration of the left heart border, but we've normal aeration of the posterior structures, the posterior angle, and some lucency extending up to the apex. If we have a lateral view, it's very easily confirmed. And the typical finding on the lateral view is going to be anterior displacement of the major fissure with homogeneous opacity anterior to it. Notice the superior segment of the lower lobe has moved all the way up to the apex, accounting for this typical apical lucency. An adult who presents like this over the age of, say, 45, is likely to have a lung cancer or some other major obstructing lesion, usually a primary lung cancer. A young child may have a foreign body. An asthmatic may have a mucus plug. Mucus plugs don't usually collapse a whole lung, though. It's pretty unusual to see an asthmatic coming in with 
a total atelectasis of a large lobe or an entire lung, but we do see it. CT scan confirms why we see this line here. That line on the lateral view is the major fissure sharply defining the collapsed upper lobe here, retracting anteriorly. Notice the entire volume in the hemithorax is decreased. There's only one other situation that you will see that line, and we'll come to that in a moment. Another typical example of total left upper lobe collapse and consolidation and the so-called Lufsickel sign, which someone describes if you like to collect named signs of the hyperaerated superior segment of the lower lobe extending up into the apex like we saw before and outlining the aortic arch. Again, that's typical of a completely collapsed upper lobe. In this case, we see a bulge at the hilum confirmed on the CT scan with a tumor surrounding and encasing the pulmonary artery and obstructing the left upper lobe bronchus. This is a very classical presentation of a primary lung cancer. should not be misinterpreted merely as pneumonia. This is collapse and consolidation. Uh, this, again, is the aeration constituting the so-called Luftsickel sign. One other thing will look very, very similar and can be a fooler if you don't think of it. This patient does not have a collapsed left upper lobe. It has got loss of the left heart border, has got volume loss, has got the line, but has surgical clips, has got a resected rib. This is a patient who had a left upper lobectomy. On the CT scan, you see the shift of the mediastinum, fat and pleural thickening constituting that line, which is mimicking a collapsed upper lobe. And in fact, you can see the shape of this soft tissue is very similar to that of a collapsed upper lobe. So any time a lobe is collapsed, you may have residual thickening, loculated fluid, organized fluid that will nicely mimic a totally collapsed lobe. You'll commonly see collapse on portable chest x-rays. Uh, this is one of the potential pitfalls if it's misinterpreted. Here's a typical collapsed upper lobe, not to be mistaken for loculated fluid. Notice that the trachea has shifted here. The minor fissure has shifted upwards. This typically occurs in intubated patients. The next day, it's almost completely resolved, a mucus plug. Very typical in that it will come and go rapidly and associate with volume loss. Another case of more complete upper lobe atelectasis and consolidation. Here there is fullness at the hilum that should suggest an obstructing mass rather than a mucus plug. And a more unusual finding, subtly different from what we looked at, here we have obliteration of the right heart border as well as opacity at the apex. And on the lateral view, we have a kind of line that we saw with the left upper lobe collapse, like anterior shift of the major fissure. And this is, in fact, due to combined upper lobe and middle lobe collapse, which is not real common because they've got separate takeoff. But if you have a large lung cancer, as you do here, it can infiltrate laterally along the hilum, and it can clip off the middle lobe as well as the upper lobe while leaving the lower lobe aerated. The more complete a collapse becomes, the more subtle it sometimes is. Here's a completely collapsed lower lobe in a patient with uh, chronic bronchiectasis. You've got indirect signs of hyperaeration of the rest of the lung, and you have a double density behind the heart here. The collapsed lobe can virtually disappear on the lateral view. It may obscure one of the hemidiaphragms, and it may produce just hazy opacity on the lateral view posteriorly. Similarly, on the left side, a completely collapsed lower lobe can be very subtle. This is too dense for aorta, and too big for that matter. Uh, you have the indirect sign of the lucency and decreased volume in the rest of the lung and just faint hazy opacity. Notice the hemidiaphragm isn't even obscured because the lobe has collapsed so completely medially. We're now seeing the outline of the diaphragm outlined by the upper lobe. Uh, classical lower lobe collapse on a portable chest x-ray. Again, a double density, very opaque behind the heart. The fissure has rotated as the lung has collapsed. We can see that on a CT scan. This is another patient, but typical bilateral lower lobe collapse. You see why we see that fissure end on, on the chest x-ray as the lobe collapses. The small lobes, of course, are very subtle because they don't account for much volume. Just a little haziness around the heart border, which you certainly can see just with a little scarring or pectus, loss of the minor fissure. The lateral view is pathognomonic. Don't call this fluid in the fissure. Fluid in the fissure doesn't look like that. First of all, there's no fluid back here. Secondly, the fissure doesn't live there. The major fissure is here. Minor fissure is normally here. This is a totally collapsed middle lobe, and it's very, very typical.
Unlike the other lobes, a collapsed middle lobe is commonly not due to malignancy. It's commonly inflammatory, so-called middle lobe syndrome, particularly in middle-aged women. If it's less collapsed and more consolidated, as it is here, it's a little more visually obvious. Uh, again, pathognomonic appearance on the lateral view. Another reason, perhaps, to look at the lateral first before getting lost in the PA. So total middle lobe atelectasis shown here nicely on the CT scan, compensatory hyperaeration of the anterior segment of the upper lobe and of the lower lobe. Right, here we have uh, something a little different. We have a focal nodular mass-like opacity, let's say. Um, this is something that can be misinterpreted as a lung cancer. Certainly it is a mass, it is regularly marginated. Uh, it does have some adjacent pleural thickening. And uh, this is suggestive of a certain entity. I'll show you another example of the same thing. I'm sure a lot of you will recognize this. The second case is a little more characteristic because you have distortion of structures as though they're being sucked into it, sometimes called a comet tail sign. And again, adjacent pleural thickening, which is a requirement for this entity, often air bronchograms at the edge. Here we have yet another example, uh, this one showing smoothly outlined opacity in the lower lobe adjacent pleural thickening. And of course, this is rounded atelectasis, and I just include it because although it's, it's quite dissimilar, it is a form of atelectasis, and it's uh, essentially a form of pleural scarring that apparently follows from organizing pleural effusions. Most of them are posterolateral like this. They don't have to be. They will always have pleural thickening, and about half of them have some history of asbestos exposure. Let me say a couple of words about bronchiectasis, which is a pretty common entity. And this, of course, by definition is dilation of the bronchial tree. The morphological types of bronchiectasis really just are a description of severity rather than etiology. So bronchiectasis can be described as cylindrical or varicoid or cystic, which is sort of self-explanatory. Uh, by the time it's cystic, it's generally going to be irreversible. We've got congenital causes, most important being cystic fibrosis, other less common causes, including Cartagener's syndrome, so-called dyskinetic cilia syndrome. And then we have the acquired ones, which we see more commonly, recurrent infections, aspiration, pneumonias, uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, an important one to remember in asthmatics, there it'll tend to be upper lobe, and MAI, which you heard Dr. Fernaki describe, also a cause of bronchiectasis in older and middle-aged women. Um, bronchiectasis, as you saw in one of the earlier talks, can often be recognized just by the appearance on chest x-ray. It tends to have a lumpy, coarse appearance caused by the thickened, dilated, mucus-filled bronchi. Sometimes one can see air-filled, dilated bronchi. And needless to say, a CT scan is the way to go. The dilated bronchi can be compared with the size of adjacent vessels. The size of the vessel and the bronchus should be roughly comparable at any one point. In this case, in the upper lobes, the bronchi are clearly larger than the adjacent vessels. As the bronchiectasis becomes more severe, one sees thickening, one sees greater degrees of dilatation, and sometimes associated consolidation and collapse, especially in the middle lobe and the lingula, as shown here. The regular shape lack of normal tapering are all going to be features. This is a good example of the so-called signet ring sign, where you've got the small vessel and the large dilated bronchus, which constitutes the so-called signet ring. Again, bronchiectasis extending distally into the middle lobe, becoming quite severe, and consolidation, varicoid bronchiectasis, and associated consolidation and cavitation. These are all increasing degrees of severity of bronchiectasis, which at this stage is irreversible. You heard about uh, some of the other causes of bronchiectasis in Dr. Fernaki's talk. This is an elderly woman with a chronic cough. Um, this is a rather typical presentation, sometimes overlooked. The findings are 
nodularity, ground glass opacity, sometimes some small nodules that are cavitated. This is a very indolent disease. This is rather typical of MAI or MAC. And uh, it's thought that the uh, MAI is the actual cause of the bronchiectasis rather than a secondary infection. It's important to diagnose because it tends to be progressive. It is difficult to treat, though, and the treatment can be quite toxic. It's necessary to diagnose by bronchial washings. Here's an example of an asthmatic patient presenting with a cough. You've got opacity in the right apex. Non-specific, but the location and the texture is a little suspicious, not an average pneumonia. You might consider TB, but you might also consider another specific entity we've mentioned. This is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis with dilated mucus-filled bronchi in the upper lobe. Uh, ABPA can get very severe and can create a large mass that can look like a lung cancer except on the CT. You can appreciate the internal texture, the low density areas that represent impacted mucus, and sometimes actually these acquire increasingly high density due to calcium content that's pretty uh, specific for ABPA. So. Uh, the majority of these, in this country at least, are asthmatics. They have eosinophilia, elevated IgE, typically central bronchiectasis in the upper lobes and a skin reaction to uh, aspergillus. One other example of an airway abnormality, an asymptomatic patient with a large mass in the upper lobe. This is a kind of an ant mini. It's not very common. But notice how smoothly marginated the mass is. And there's some hyperlucency associated in the rest of the lobe. This, of course, is a bronchocele, a massively dilated bronchus due to a long-standing obstruction. And generally, this degree of dilatation implies that the obstruction has been there since birth or before. Uh, in this case, a stricture can be congenital, less likely a malignant tumor, possibly a benign lesion or a foreign body. This was actually congenital bronchial atresia, and this is typically where it occurs, usually the left upper lobe posterior apical segment. The mass is the bronchocele, and the air trapping is what we see distally. And finally, let me say a word about tumors of the pleura, both localized fibrous tumors, which we used to call benign mesotheliomas, lipomas and liposarcomas, and importantly, malignant mesothelioma. The localized benign fibrous tumor of the pleura can be very large and can be relatively asymptomatic, but a percentage of these will turn out to be fibrosarcomas, so they're not inherently benign. Uh, peak incidence over 50, they have some strange and not completely explained associated findings like HPO, a very high association with hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, and hypoglycemia. So this would be a good kind of a boards case, obviously. Uh, those that are malignant, again, are fibrosarcomas. This has nothing to do with asbestos exposure. They can be pedunculated, which is interesting. If you see something flopping around in the pleura, this is probably what it's going to be. Most are not calcified but virtually all of them will enhance with contrast on a CT scan. Uh, small lesions such as this picked up on a chest X-ray could be anything including a metastasis, but the CT scan is pathognomonic when it has fat density. This is completely typical of a lipoma. Mesothelioma, of course, when it's malignant, is going to be a diffuse lesion typically with lumpy pleural thickening, encasement of the entire lung, this would be a typical case, often extending into the pleural fissures. Uh, these may have uh, associated pleural effusion in the majority of cases, uh, big lymph nodes in the mediastinum. Pleural calcification is commonly seen, but that's usually going to be due to pre-existing asbestos exposure. It isn't necessarily a feature of the tumor itself. And chest wall invasion occurs in 20% when they're advanced. These, of course, have a very high association with asbestos exposure and a long latent period, greater risk with uh, certain kinds of asbestos, such as crocidolite and um, amosite. Again, a typical example of malignant mesothelioma, loculated pleural effusion. <laughs> 
There is some advantage in MR for malignant mesothelioma in that we can do a better job, as in this case, of distinguishing the thickened pleura from associated pleural effusion or consolidated lung. And we now measure the thickness of the pleura in these patients who are undergoing chemotherapy, of which there are a number of interesting trials ongoing at present. Uh, metastatic disease can be indistinguishable from mesothelioma. This is endometrial carcinoma, but it tends to be more lumpy and more discrete and less uh, uniformly encasing of the pleura than malignant mesothelioma.